Father, we know that we're living in such a special time. And so we ask for your presence to remain with us and that you alert our minds and hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to say happy Sabbath to each one. And I want to thank again Brother and Sister Norwood for being so kind for the invitation that we can join with you in this sacred hour. And I believe, brothers and sisters, that just what inspiration tells us, we're told in the book Evangelism, page 363 and 364, that in place of so many sermons, that we need to open up the Bible text by text. Do you believe that? That we need to understand what we believe for ourselves. We need to understand what God has given us in this last hour. In fact, the Bible says in the book of Ezekiel, if you'll turn with me there, to the book of Ezekiel chapter 3. To the book of Ezekiel chapter 3, and I want us to notice what the Bible says in Ezekiel the third chapter. You need, we need messages out of the common order of things. You know, we've become complacent in a generation that we're in now where we hear messages that kind of comfort us and yet they do not arouse us for the needed preparation. Do you believe that we can be ready without preparation? Do you believe that? Do you believe that any one of us are ready to meet the crisis in our own strength and by ourselves? There must be a different work, a greater work. In fact, all over the world, Jesus is getting a people ready to meet him. And the Bible says in Ezekiel, the third chapter, beginning in verses 17, let's read that together. The Bible says in Ezekiel 3, beginning in verses 17, and when you get there, if you'll let me know by saying amen. The Bible says, Son of man, I have made thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore hear the word where? At my mouth. You know, right now God is looking for messengers that will listen to the word, and that means that he must, the messenger, must get close to Jesus. And his ear must be open to the words of God. The Bible says, hear the word at my mouth. And it says, and give him what? Give them not messages of peace, but what? Give them warning from me. The Bible says, when I say unto the wicked, thou shalt surely die. Thou givest him not warning, nor speakest to warn the wicked from his way, to save his life. The same wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood will I require where? Do you know that as a minister of God? If I did not give you the message of God, that if you die in your sin, your blood would be on my hands. Amen? Now, I'm going to say this, and I don't want to have to embarrass anybody in this room, but if you're talking, please, we don't want to be talking in the presence of Jesus. Amen? You see, when we put on cell phones and talk, we distract ourselves from the presence of God. And we're told that the cheap talking that takes place in the church is enough to shut out the Spirit of God. And if the church is without the Spirit, the Bible says the minister is going to be blamed for it. Did you know that? And so this is why we're told that as ministers today, we have the direct traffic. You know in the church, too much goes on that should not go on. And man loses a sense of the reverence and the respect of God. You see, God is very real. And when we study, God's presence comes into this church. And we don't want God's presence to leave because of our neglect. But it's only the mercy of God we're not consumed. What do you say? Do you know that if we were to go back 4,000 years ago and a man would have talked in the church, he could have been struck down dead. If a man would have came in, I'll never forget one church, a man came in with a cell phone on his ear. Now tell me something, in church, you're going to listen to a cell phone on your ear? In church, we're to be listening to the voice of, of God. And so if you have a cell phone, please, let us not insult the Spirit of God by leaving it on. Amen? You see, the devil will cause that cell phone to ring at just the time when we need to hear the voice of God the most. And so I'm going to give you an opportunity. Sometimes we forget but I want to give you an opportunity if you have a cell phone. Please move it to either one or two positions. Move it to vibrate that it doesn't disturb somebody else or cut it off. Amen? We believe that when the Bible is open, that God's presence is here. 
And the Bible says, give them warning from me. If you do not warn the wicked, they may die in their sins, but his blood will be required at your hand. And my friends, I have enough sin on my life then to add yours to mine. Amen? The Bible says in the book of Luke, what book did I say? In the book of Luke 19, notice what the Bible says in the book of Luke, the 19th chapter. You know, some people ask, I wonder what Jesus would preach if he were here. I wonder what would be the message on Jesus' lips. And I've asked myself the question that time, what would Jesus preach if he were here today? And we don't have to wonder what he would preach. In Luke, the 19th chapter, we see exactly what Jesus would preach if he were here today. In the book of Luke 19, and when you get there, let me know by saying amen. amen. In Luke, the 19th chapter, beginning in verses 41, let's read that together. The Bible says in the book of Luke 19, beginning in verse 41, the Bible says, and when he was come where? When he was come near. He beheld the city and wept over it. Jesus was crying. And do you know that you could just put any city you want in this world in place of that city? You see, the Bible says he beheld the city and wept over it. And if Jesus were to come to Gentry, Jesus would not look at the church and the schools and the magnificent buildings and say, look at our institution and our churches. Jesus, when he looks at our schools and churches and our homes, Jesus would cry at our condition. You see, my friends, we're not ready for what's getting ready to take place. We're coming to church and prayer meetings. We're going to school and play and work, and not once are we hearing the warning message telling us to get ready, to get ready to get ready. But Jesus says that before the sealing takes place, he is going to send his message through all of his churches and in the midst of Jerusalem, God's messengers will sigh and cry for all the abominations that are done. My friends, you must understand that there is a work of restoration that must take place in our hearts. There's a work of restoration that must take place in our homes. And there's a work of restoration that must take place in our churches. And when Jesus sees this condition, the Bible says that Jesus cries. Why is he crying? Verse 42, the Bible says, saying, If thou hast known. If what? If thou hast known. Even there thou at least in this thy day the things which belong unto thy peace, but now they are hid from the eyes. Jesus said, if my people had only knew, because you know when Jesus beheld the city, he was not looking at Babylon. He was not looking at the churches that are going to church on Sunday. You know who Jesus was looking at when he cried? He was looking at Jerusalem. Oh, Jerusalem. How often would I have gathered you under my wings as a hen gathered her chickens, but she would not. And he said, Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. Jesus was crying over the condition of his people, and his people did not know what was getting ready to take place. They were going to the temple, and they said, Jesus, look at the building of this temple. Look at it. It's beautiful. And Jesus said, You don't know what's about to take place. There is a crisis that is coming. And while men are saying, give us smooth messages, preach peace and safety, Jesus says, a storm is coming, my friends. And the only way that we can be prepared is by running into Jesus. The Bible says in Luke 19, the beginning in verse 42, it goes back and say, if thou had known, even thou at least in this thy day, the things which belong unto thy peace, but now they are hid from thine eyes. Verse 43 says, For the days shall come, this is a prophecy, when what's going to take place? That thine enemies shall cast a trench about thee and compass thee round and keep thee in on every side. What does it mean to compass? It means to be surrounded. Jesus said there's coming a time when my people are going to be surrounded and they don't even know it. Do you know there's seven evidence that we're surrounded in these cities? Do you know that God has told us 
that a crisis is coming and that God's people are to get out of the cities and to retired country places where they can grow their own fruits and vegetables for in the future the problem of buying and selling will become very serious. And my brothers and sisters, I'm going to show you today that that is just a few short months to a few short years away and God's people are hearing that prosperity is coming and peace is coming and safety is coming and we're hearing it from the press and from the pulpits. But my friends, the Bible says when they shall say peace and safety, then is sudden destruction. It's time for you and I to get ready like never before. And let me tell you something, young people, God is counting on you young people. Do you know that God is going to rightly train a young generation to have an army of youth that are going to finish the work? And this is why Satan is trying to make our young people uninterested in this message. He's afraid of what young people can do when they give their hearts to Jesus. You see, my friends, every revival and revolution has centered in young people. Whether good or bad, the great controversy hangs on who will reach the youth and this generation. You see, my friends, Hitler himself focused on the young people in the revolution, and we're told that in the last work that God is going to largely work through young people when persecution starts and adults are put in prison and are languishing in prison cell. The Bible says that God's spirit is going to rest upon the children who have been rightly trained. But let me tell you something. Veggie tales are not going to train our children. Let me tell you something. Sesame Street is not going to train our children. Barney and all this other fluff that we're giving them is not going to get them ready for the crisis. We must give them this training that was given to Daniel and the three Hebrew boys. They were not trained in the public schools of this world. They were not trained in the schools that even called themselves Christian but would not follow the principles of God. They were trained by parents who believe what God had said was coming. And my friends, God is going to have a generation today, and God is counting on you fathers and mothers to do the work of John the Baptist. You know, there never could have been a John the Baptist unless there was an Elizabeth and a Zacharias. You read about him in Luke chapter 1. The Bible says that both the father and mother of Zacharias were blameless, walking in the counsel of God. They read Adventist home and child guidance. They read the messages to young people and were training their children according to God's blueprint. The Bible says that, you know, in the natural order of things, John the Baptist should have been trained in the rabbinical schools as a priest. Did you know that? Zacharias was a priest, his father. But John the Baptist, you know what Zacharias said? Zacharias says, John, I know what is going on in the world. I must take you away from the city into the wilderness where I can give you God's training and God's special way so that you can make ready a people prepared to meet Jesus. And we're told that in this last hour, it won't be everybody. But there are going to be some parents that love God and their children enough to leave the conveniences of the city, to leave the comforts of city life, and they are going to go away from the populated cities. It's almost impossible to raise our children in these wicked cities. And they're going to get a generation that loves God, and they're going to look up, and they're going to do just what Zacharias and Elizabeth did, and as a result, they're going to be the development of John the Baptist that prepares the way for Jesus to come. Not now, the first time, but the second time. And brothers and sisters, somebody says, well, I'm not going to do that. Well, the Bible gives the answer if we don't do that. Luke 19, look at what it says. Verse 43, the Bible says, after talking about there will be surrounded in verse 43, the Bible says, and verse 44, and shall lay thee how? Even with the ground. But not only the adults, it says, if you don't follow the plan, and get out like God told Jerusalem and his people in Jerusalem, get out of there. He said, if you don't, when you're surrounded, the Bible says he's going to lay thee even with the ground, but not the adults only. It says, and thy children where? Within thee. And they shall leave in thee not one stone upon another. Why, Jesus? Because 
Thou knewest not the time of what? Of thy visitation. My brothers and my sisters, we have a great work to accomplish. And we have but a little time in which to do it. And if we will not know now, Jesus will look at us and cry when he sees us, our homes and schools and churches, and he will say, if you don't get ready, they're soon going to be hid from your eyes. And you may think that everything's all right, but when the time of trouble starts and the mark of the beast is implemented, do you know how many Seventh-day Adventist churches are going to wake up? You know how many homes are going to say, oh, I wish I followed what Jesus said. Do you know how many young people are going to see that the world has nothing to offer then? But it's going to be too late. It's going to be too late to get things ready. But this morning, it is not too late. This morning, we have just enough time to start today. What do you say? And so as we get ready to study this evening, this afternoon, I pray that we've come ready to study. We've already studied last night. We've laid a foundation this morning. And if you weren't here, you missed a lot. But we're going to pick up and try to bring us all together because there is a great work. What is the great work? Jesus must make us look just like himself. He must bring us to the point where man is, has victory over every sin through the power of the indwelling Christ by the passing of a national Sunday law. And my friends, we have a little time in which to do this because as I said, we have but just a few short months to a few short years before this takes place and we need to understand it from the Bible. What do you say? And so before we get into that message this morning, I pray that you might reverently kneel with me as we approach the Lord in prayer. And we want to spend a few moments just silently asking God that he might soften and open up our hearts. That we might say, as Eli taught Samuel, speak, Lord. For thy servant listeneth. And after a few moments of silent prayer, I'll close out out loud from up front. Oh, Father, when I think of how hard your heart breaks when you look at us, you want to save us, Lord. You want to do everything in your power, but so often we will not give you the time. Many times we wake up in the morning and before we do anything, we are rushing to work and to school with barely a few moments even to talk to you, dear Master. But this morning, we're asking that you'll do something special for us. We're asking, Lord, that you'll have mercy upon our mistakes and our de de deliberate decisions to turn from you. And we're praying that you will heal our backsliders. We're praying, Lord, for a revival and reformation to take place in our hearts. And you promise, Lord, that unless there's a re revival and reformation, that our homes and schools and churches are in trouble. But you said that we're prisoners of hope, that if we turn to Jesus, that we will see a revival and reformation that has not been witnessed since apostolic times. And Lord, we long for this today. We know that we're living in the time of the great shaking that is intensifying, and soon everything will shake that can be shaken, and only those things that are connected with Jesus will remain. And so we're asking that you would unite us with Christ, we're asking that you would open up our hearts and whatever changes that need to be made through the living Jesus, we pray that you would allow them to be done in us and for us and through us so that when everything breaks, that we will be safely here in Jesus Christ, that we might have found a shelter in the time of storm. And so, Lord, we ask that you would abide with us this morning. 
that you remove every distraction, that you would gather talking mouths and hush them and bring us into a place where whatever you want, Lord, we want to follow, that you would give us the love of Jesus so that we might go where you lead the way. And so we ask that you will abide with us and give us as much of the Holy Spirit as we may receive without being consumed. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Lord, I want to be a Christian in my heart, in my heart. Lord, I want to be a Christian in my heart. Would you sing it with me like a prayer? In my heart, in my heart, Lord, I want to be a Christian in my heart. Oh, Father, as we open your words, we want to be Christians in our hearts. We want to be just like Jesus. And so we ask that you'll abide with us in Jesus' name, amen. If you will take your Bibles and turn with me in your Bibles to the book of 1 Thessalonians. What book did I say? And 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. And you know that I said that I want to see your Bibles. I know that some more have joined us that maybe were not with us last night or this morning. We said that everything we believe should be based where? Upon the Bible. And so if you have your Bible, just raise them up high so that I can see that you have a Bible. Now, if you don't have a Bible, whether old or young, if you can read, you want to have a Bible. Amen? You want to sit next to someone who does. You want to begin sharing Bibles. If we don't have Bibles, we can begin sharing our Bibles to make sure that every one of us can see for ourselves what the Bible says. Because if truly we're living in the last few months to the last few years of this earth's history, we don't want to guess about this. We don't want to speculate about what a man says or think or what a church teaches. We want to believe everything based upon the Word of God. What do you say? And so I encourage you, don't take what a man says. Look at the Bible for yourself. In fact, we read this quotation when we started. In the book of Great Controversy, look at what this says. Great Controversy, page 598, it says, Ignorance will not excuse young or old. Because there is in their hands a faithful presentation of that law and of its principles and claims, it is not enough to have good intentions. Is it not enough to have what? You see, a man can want something good, but that's not enough. It's not enough to have good intentions. It is not enough to do what a man thinks is right or what the minister tells him is right. This is why I tell you, bring your Bible and look at it for yourself. Amen? It says... His soul, salvation, is at stake, and he should search the Scriptures, how? For himself. However confident, however strong he may be, his convictions are right. However confident he may be that the minister knows what is truth, this is not his foundation. He has a what? A chart pointing out every way mark on the heavenward journey and he ought not to guess at how many things. Now, how many things is anything? Now, does the Bible say that? Or do you believe the Bible and the Spirit of Prophecy say something different? Does the Bible say that? In Amos 3, 7, it says, Surely the Lord God will do how many things? Then if he will do nothing but reveal his secrets to his servants, the prophets, that means if he reveals this to the prophets, how many things must we guess at if we study the prophets? We have to guess at nothing. We don't have to guess at anything. Why? Because God has given us a chart pointing out not some, but every way mark on the heavenward journey. Now, where does the chart end? Well, it ends in the heavenward journey. It ends in heaven. Amen? And if we're not in heaven in 2009, we're somewhere on that chart today. Am I correct? Now, if you're on a chart, if you were to go into a mall and you go down into the mall, and you're in a rush, 
And so you want to get to a store that you don't know where it's at. What do you do when you go into the mall? You want to get to a store and you don't have much time. Well, you go to a directory. Is that right? In the directory, there's there with a map. And on the map, it shows you all the stores in the mall. But that map will mean nothing to you unless you identify three words. Do you know what the three words are? You are where? Here. If you don't know where you are on the chart, then the rest of the chart doesn't do any good for you. And so when we talk about the prophetic chart that goes all the way on the heavenward journey and points out every way marked so that we ought not to guess at anything, what we have to do is find out what the chart says, the map before us, and then we must plot where you are and then begin to see what's going to take place next. Are you with me? And you don't have to guess about that. When I was coming down here and I was putting in the maps and, and programming where to go and I was going down here, I did not guess at the streets that I was going to pass because every way mark was on the maps. And do you know that while this world has GPSs, the Bible and the spirit of prophecy is our GPS. It's a globally positioning satellite and the satellite is not something in the second space. God's satellite is in the most holy place of heaven's sanctuary and if we tie in there, we don't have to guess at where we are on this journey. But the problem is, too many have exchanged their Bibles for their physical GPSs. They've exchanged their time in prayer to talking on their cell phones. They've exchanged their ability to get interested in the things of God. And now we have a generation that loves pleasure more than we love Jesus. You know that we can go down to football games and basketball games and we can stay there for hours. I don't know one sport that's over in 30 minutes. Do you know any sport that's over in 30 minutes? And man will watch it for 30 minutes. Man will play it for 30 minutes, and he will go on hour after hour, but let him come to church, and 45 minutes later, he's ready to leave. I wonder where that came from. We are a generation that loves what? Pleasure more than we love Jesus. And my friends, I'm going to tell you something. No man that loves pleasure more than he loves Jesus will ever be ready to meet Jesus. And the only thing that can make us look at television for hours and no man complains when he watches television two or three hours, he doesn't say, honey, we watched it for three hours, cut it off. He says, well, let's see if we can go into overtime. He says, let's see how many more video games we can play. I never forget talking to some young boy. And we were talking, it's not their fault, and we were just talking back and forth, and I asked them a question. I said, tell me, because I like to talk to young people, and I said, tell me, how long do you play video games on average time? And I said, he said, well, I can tell you, I play no less than three hours a day on video games. If there's any young person here, he can testify that that's true. No less than three hours a day, he says, I don't have to, he said, I won't even mind playing video games for three hours a day. And then I asked him, why does he do it? And it's simple. He loves the game. Is that right? When a man loves something, it's not hard to spend time doing it. In fact, you take that same child that loves the video game and you put in a game that he does not like and in five minutes he's ready to throw it away. The difference is not the game. The difference is where our love is. And if we don't love the truth, if we don't love Jesus, we will not be ready for what's getting ready to take place. And if we, you know, we don't naturally love God, we have to pray and say, Lord, create in me a clean heart. I remember when I was growing up, I didn't love the Bible. I didn't enjoy reading this book. I was turning in the wrong direction, going to hell instead of heaven. And Jesus came into my life. And he gave me a new desire and a new love. And where I loved other things, the Bible took the place of those times that I was given to the devil. And I began to give it to Jesus. And as Jeremiah said, I found his words and did eat them. And they became to me the joy and the rejoicing of my heart. Now you could not pay me to watch the television. My friends, when you look at the real drama of the ages, the television is a cheap imitation. I mean, think of it. You have to pay to get HBO. But do you know that in God's television, he gives us open box office free of charge? You talk about surround sound in God's television, it surrounds us, the sights and sounds of nature. And as we behold it, instead of the filth of Hollywood, we get the cleanness and the glory of heaven. And by beholding, my friends, we become changed into the image of Jesus. And this is why Satan has developed the sitcom. You know that? Did you know that Satan developed the sitcom? Did you know that? 
You know how long a sitcom is? How long is a sitcom? 30 minutes. You know why? And do you know that in the 30 minutes, we call them sitcoms, and in the 30 minutes, there is a commercial that comes about every five minutes. It's programmed that way, purposely. And you and I are getting programmed, don't know it. We sit down. You know what we're doing in a commercial? What are we doing in a commercial? You know what we're doing in a commercial? Time to get the chips and the drink, and we do everything we need to do. If we got, if we got to go to the bathroom, hold it into the commercial. Commercial comes, we go to the bathroom. Then we come back. You know what that does? It trains the mind to an attention span of only five minutes. And if I watch it day by day and week by week and year by year, you know what happens? I create a generation that has the lowest attention span that it ever was. Then I call it ADT. No, no, no. It's a problem watching television. You see, my friends, there's a problem with what we put in our bodies. This is a result of changing God's program. And now when we come to church, five minutes after the minister stops, there's no commercial. But our minds still go in the commercial. And so we start looking around and watch the fly and the lights over here, and our minds are distracted, and we miss the truth. When our minds come back and when the commercial is over, we miss the main points that will show us what's happening. And Satan has done this so that he would destroy a desire to love the Bible. He's created a generation that loves everything but the Bible. But if you and I will come back, I destroyed this mind and what I used to do. I destroyed my body, but when I came to Jesus, Jesus has a plan of redemption. What do you say? No matter how many mistakes we've made, no matter how many faults we have, if we would come to Jesus, whether as husbands or wives, whether as fathers or mothers, whether as children and young people, no matter how much mistakes that we've made, Jesus went to the cross of Calvary so that he could forgive us for all those mistakes. But he also went there so that he can give us power so that we can change our lives, that we don't keep falling back into the same pitfalls. He can keep us from falling. What do you say? And so the Bible tells us that we have a chart pointing out every waymark on the heavenward journey, and we ought not to guess at, at anything. But that depends upon us knowing the chart. Is that right? And so how is it that we're going to know the chart? I studied this morning, and we found out that Jesus said that there are certain things that if we see them, we can know that his coming is near, even at the door. And I said that in 2008, we reached that. Someone came to me and said, what happened in 2008? Well, I'll tell you later on this evening. Amen? But something happened in 2008 that brought us to what the Bible says even at the door, and the Bible says that when we get to the door, that that generation shall not pass until all these things be what? Be fulfilled. Are we guessing? Jesus said, no, no, no. You can know just as the leaves show you that summer is coming and spring is coming, you can know when you see the signs that his coming is near and that this generation shall not pass until all of these things be fulfilled. But we found out that in order to understand, we must be children of, of the light. 1 Thessalonians 5, beginning in verses 2. And when you get there, let me know by saying amen. In 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 2, the Bible says, For yourselves know what? Perfectly, that the day of the Lord so come of how? As a thief in the night. And I told you that many say, well, what do you mean, preacher? You said that we can know that his coming is near, that we can understand where we are on the chart, that we ought not to guess at anything, but the Bible says that the coming of God is going to be as a thief where? In the night. And I say, yes, I believe that. But my friends, we can't just read one text and then close our Bibles. Amen? We cannot live by one word. The Bible says, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. That's what a Christian does. He lives by all of the words of God. My friends, if we study this Bible, while there are going to be some that are surprised, everybody is not going to be surprised. The Bible says in verse 3, it says in verse 3, 4, when they shall say what? Peace. And safe. In other words, when man says everything's all right, when they say we are past the financial crisis, everything is good, when they shall say peace and safety. You know, when we heard about the financial crisis, many say, oh, yeah, last year or so, we better get ready, get out of the city, get ready for God. 
And then we thought it went by, and everybody said, well, it's not really that serious. We have time to play and to work and to do everything else. But my friends, the prophecies are going on. Everything is taking place just as the chart says. And we don't have to guess. And do you know that many young people that have been prizing the world and worldly careers above the things of God, they're going to wake up at the mark of the beast and they're going to say, why did not my mother and father and pastor and teacher and adult, why did not somebody tell me that it was this serious? And do you know we're told that many, when they wake up in the second resurrection, are going to be tearing apart limb from limb teachers and pastors and adults. Why? Because they told them smooth things. They said peace and safety when a storm was coming. My friends, the Bible says, give them warning from me. Let them know and let them have an opportunity to get ready. The Bible says that while some will be surprised, not everybody, sudden destruction is coming. Verse 4 says, but ye brethren are what? Are not in darkness. That that day should overtake you as a thief. That means that while somebody is going to be surprised, there is going to come another class of people that will not be surprised. The Bible says, you brethren are not in darkness. That that day, the second coming of Jesus, in time events, that that day should overtake you as a thief. Why? Verse 5, what does it say? Ye are all the children of light and the children of day. We are not of night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. Question, what was it that caused them not to be surprised by the coming of Jesus? What was it? They were children of what? They were children of what? They were children of light. Question, what does it mean to be a child of light? Because if we're not part of the children of light, the coming of Jesus will overtake us as a thief. But what does it mean to be a part of the children of light? What is the children of light? What is that talking about? What does light represent in the Bible? Jesus is the light. What else? The word of God is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Jesus has given us his word. And in his word, he's given us something that says a lie. Go to the book of 2 Peter. What book did I say? Remember now, the Bible explains itself. We don't have to make it up. When it says children of light that are not going to be surprised by the coming of Jesus, the Bible explains what it is. Somebody says, Jesus, yes, Jesus is the light of the world. And Jesus has given us something so that we're not in darkness. Jesus has given us his word. The word is a lamp into our feet and a light into our path. And Jesus has given us his word. But every church claims to believe the word. There is something in the word that is a light that gives us and makes us children of light. Jesus, in his word, has given us something. What is it? Second Peter chapter 1. And when you get there, let me know by saying amen. In 2 Peter chapter 1, beginning, and verse 19, let's read it together. 2 Peter 1, verse 19, notice what the Bible says. Beginning in verse 19, what does the Bible say? We have also a what? And early this morning, I said that I'm more than sure. Somebody said, how can you be so sure? I'm more than sure. Why? Because we have a more sure word of Prophecy, a what? A more sure word of what? Of prophecy. Whereunto you do well that ye take heed as unto a, as unto a, now does everybody have the same Bible that I'm reading? I don't hear anybody. Are we all together? Do, do we know what we're talking about? We're looking at what this children of light is. We're trying to understand what light is. And the Bible explains itself. Jesus has given us his word, but what is in the word that shows us what's coming? The Bible says, we have a more sure word of prophecy. Whereunto you do well that you take heed as unto a light. So prophecy is like unto a light. Now think about this. If it's nighttime, and you go outside, and you get into your car, and it's nighttime, what is one of the first things you're going to do in your car? You're going to cut on the lights. Why? 
so that you can see what is in front of you. And so prophecy is like unto a light, and then it goes into the darkness of the future in front of you and show you what's ahead of you before you get there. But now you have two options. You see, if you were in your car and you cut on the lights and there's a brick wall in front of you, you can choose to keep going forward or you can choose to stop and turn around. Are you with me? And so you do well to take heed to that light. If you see a brick wall, only a fool would keep going forward. Is that right? And if the prophecy shows us that a brick wall of a crisis is coming and we continue to go without preparing, my friends, we're a little more than fools, the Bible says, foolish virgins that make no preparation for the coming crisis. And we're told that the majority of Seventh-day Adventists are going to be foolish virgins. Did you know that? Did you know that we're told that the majority of youth and adults within the Seventh-day Adventist church, that over 90% are going to be shaken out because they don't believe the prophets are serious, just like in the Old Testament. They didn't believe in Noah. When Noah preached his message, they thought that Noah was a wild, wild crazy fanatic. The world come to an end by flood. It had never even rained. They said, how can Noah be right? But let me tell you something. Did it rain? Did the world come to an end? And only those who heeded the message were prepared. Only eight souls in a whole world because only a few of them that were living took it serious. And Jesus looked at that time and says, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the coming of the Son of Man. And while God's messengers today are giving the trumpet a certain sound, trying to warn the inhabitants of the world to get ready before it is too late, there are those that say, oh, don't believe them. Peace and safety. Don't believe them. Everything's all right. They're extremists and fanatics. But my friends, everything we say is in the Bible. Is that right? Everything we believe should be based where? Upon the words of Jesus. And the Bible says that this crisis is getting ready to take place. And how we're going to know? We're going to be children of light. Who are children of light? Children of light are students of prophecy. They have studied the prophecies. But not only have they studied the prophecies, there's something else that must take place. Verse 19 says, That you do well, that you take heed as a light that does what? 2 Peter 1.19 That shineth in a dark place. Until, until what? Until the day dawn and the day star does what? Arise in your hearts. Who is the day star? So if all you do is study prophecy and you never come to the point where you allow Jesus to arise in your heart, you're not a child of light. Jesus is the light of the world. And as you study the prophecies, the purpose of God is to press us, to draw us unto himself so that we can open the door to the heart to Jesus and he can come in and the day can dawn and the day star, Jesus Christ, can arise where? In our hearts. And when we do that, we become children of prophecy. We become students of prophecy and we don't have to guess at anything. In fact, there are two things that are necessary in order for the child that has accepted Jesus to know and become that child of light. Number one is in the next verse. What does it say? 2 Peter 1 verse 21. It goes on to say, verse 20. 2 Peter 1 verse 20. It says, knowing what? So in other words, before prophecy can become a light unto you, there's something that you must know first. Knowing this first, what do you must know first? What does the Bible say? What must you know first? What does the Bible say? I don't hear you. That no prophecy of the Scripture is of what? Of any private interpretation. What does private mean? What does private mean? If a man has a private jet, what type of jet is it? Is it everybody's jet? It's his what? His personal jet. And so if I have a private interpretation, it is not the interpretation of the Bible. It is the interpretation of myself, of my mind. I'll never forget. I went into a store, and they were taking, collecting money for children that were homeless and less fortunate. And I came out the store, and I saw them collecting money, so I gave them a little money. When I gave them a little money, they gave me a track. 
When they gave me a track on the back side, it was talking about prophecy. And on the back side of the, tra of the track, it said on it that the mark of the beast was a computer in New York City. That's what it really said. And do you believe that? Now, what text in the Bible says a computer in New York City? Does any text say that? You see, that is a private interpretation. The Bible does not explain that. But in order for you to be a child of light, when you accept Jesus and you're studying the prophecies, you cannot make the prophecies say what you want it to say. You must allow the Bible to explain itself, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scriptures is of any private interpretation. And when you do that, the Bible becomes a more sure word of prophecy. But there's something else you must learn. What was number one? In order to become a child of light when you accept Jesus, you must study the Bible in what way? How do you study the prophecy? To allow the Bible to interpret or explain itself. But number two, notice what the Bible says in the book of Job. What book did I say? In the book of Job, J-O-B, after Chronicles, you'll see the book of Job just before the book of Psalms. In Job chapter 10, I want you to notice what the Bible says near the end of the chapter. Now, my brothers and sisters, I want to ask you a question. Up here, I have on the board this children of darkness. And it says here, if you can see that, and if you're taking notes, just write it down as I say it. If you can't see it in the back, I'm going to say it to you so you can understand what's taking place. But I have children of darkness on this board. Then I have right here, it says the letter G. Now, how many letters are in alphabet? How many letters in alphabet? 26. Now, anybody who knows math knows that if you have 26 possibilities, how many combinations, different ones, can take place if you have 27, 26 different possibilities? How many different combinations? You know, there are literally millions and billions of different word setups that you can have, different combinations. If you just have four numbers, you have thousands upon different combinations that can take place. But when you have 26 different numbers or possibilities, the number of combinations are almost endless. And I'm going to ask you to tell me what is the next letter in all of the 26 that you can choose from because there is a system that is being followed here and the first letter is, what do you see? G. Now, anything from A to Z. The second letter is what? C. Now, a pattern is being developed. G. C. What's the next letter? E. What's the next letter? B. What's the next letter? D. What's the next letter? Hey, all these different possibilities, 26 letters, there are more than 10 more to select from. F, what is the next letter? What's the next letter? No, not after F, what's the next letter? In other words, we're looking, are these in order? This G, C. So B is not next. So how do we know what the next letter is? You see G, C, E, what's the next letter that's going to come? What do you say? No. The next letter is H. Now, how in the world could you get that? Now, it would have been impossible for you to tell me without understanding the system. Are you with me? It would have almost been impossible for you not to understand the system. But in the child of darkness, this is the way that he sees prophecy. You see, you can study prophecy and still be in darkness. There is a way to study prophecy that helps the light to cut on. And the first thing is that the Bible must explain itself. But the second thing is in the book of Job that we're going to read. And now I want to read, this, I want to read the formula to you. Now this formula I'm getting ready to read to you is worth more than a million dollars. I was talking to a man who had that much money. And I said to him, you can trade me your million dollars for this. This formula is worth more. I would not trade this for a million dollars. This formula, if you understand this formula, you don't have to guess at anything. You can know where you are today. You can understand what it means a little time. I remember now in school, I used to hate school. I never studied, but I liked math. And I would make good grades in math. I messed up in everything else. But I made good grades in math. But my brothers and my sisters, in math, 
When I say I messed up, I'll tell you, I didn't study, but I still got pretty good grades. I would come into the final exams and not even know there was a final exam. And you know, many of us are doing that right now. We're coming up to the final exam of the Sunday law, and many think they're going to slide in, but we're not going to slide into heaven. We're only going to walk into heaven if we're walking with Jesus. And my friends, I remember, though, in when you get up to higher math, if you ever take algebra and you're studying through the system of the triangle, if you're studying through a proof in the triangle and you're solving for X, if you know two sides of the triangle, you can know the third side. Now, do you know that that formula, if we rightly understand it, would show us when the Sunday law is coming? Look what it says. In the book Education, a wonderful book, in the book Education, page 178, we find these tremendous words. In the book Education, page 178, notice what this says. It says, the history, the what? Now, I used to hate history in school. But when I started getting to the prophecies and my mind was converted, I said, why did I not pay attention in class? And I went back to all those books and started restudying. You see, this says, because you cannot understand prophecy unless you first understand history. Now listen to what this says. The history which the great I am has marked out where? In his word. You're 19 link after link in the prophetic chain. Now, if you miss a link, how good is a chain? If you miss a link, how good is a chain? It's no good. So in the prophecy, you must know scene by scene, act by act, play by play, event by event. And it says, God in the word has united link after link in the prophetic chain. From eternity in the past to eternity in the future, he tells us where we are today in the procession of the ages. Now I want to ask you a question. What's today's date? What's today's date? The 21st of what? Of November. You know that we should know where we are today in the prophetic chart. You should be able to pinpoint. Remember, when you go into the mall, if you're in a rush, three words. You are here. Listen to what this says. This tells us how to know we're here. From eternity in the past to eternity in the future tells us where we are today in the procession of the ages and what may be expected when? In the time to come. All that prophecy has foretold. How much? Then we don't have to guess at anything. All that prophecy has foretold has come to pass until the present time has been traced on the pages of history. I know, my brothers and sisters, if we had time, we would go down. And we would go down year by year, and we can walk down from the war in heaven. We can go all the way through from the first act in the drama all the way to the last act, and we can see where we are. And remember, I talked to you earlier about some men that came to me, sincere, well-meaning men that said, young man, I used to preach just like you preached. But I'm a grandfather now, and I have children and great-grandchildren. How can you be so sure? And I said, no, you didn't preach like me, because there's a difference between a UFO and a IFO. What is a UFO? It is a unidentified. What is an IFO? I showed that those people misapplied where they were on the prophetic chart, and so they did not know where they were today. Because we said we have to prove that the Sunday law could not have been passed based on the prophetic of events until after 1990. Did you hear what I said? After when? 1990. I'm going to prove that. Now this says, all the prophecy has foretold is coming to pass until the present time has been traced on the page of history. Now if we're right, if we're true, then what the prophecy says, we should be able to go back to the history books and then authenticate it. Am I right? Because what God said, once it happens, prophecy becomes history. Prophecy becomes history. First God said it will take place. Then it happens, it becomes history. We believe, it strengthens our faith, and we can have the faith of Jesus if we believe it. And so it goes on to say, by the way, where was Jesus' faith based on? Was it based on the prophecies? How were we to know that Jesus was the Messiah? Based on what Jesus said alone? 
based on what? He said, the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of heaven is at hand, repent ye and believe the gospel. So the Savior himself based his gospel message on the prophecies. And if we don't base our gospel message on the prophecies, we're not following Jesus. He's the one that said the time is fulfilled in Mark 1, verses 14 and 15. And the time that was fulfilled was the prophecies of Daniel and the revelation as they later came to us. And so this says it should be traced on the page of history. And we may be assured that how much? All which is yet to come will be fulfilled. How? I love this part. How is it going to be fulfilled? Three words. In its order. Would you say that with me? In its order. One more time. In its order. So then it behooves us to understand the order of events in the prophecies. Are you with me? When we study the prophecies, we can't know, simply know that this is going to happen and this is going to happen. We must understand that everything that God has said will be fulfilled in its order. And so the second thing we need to understand, if we're going to understand the formula, if we're going to not be surprised, we must understand the order of prophetic events. Now I want to come back to this because a child of light, look at what the Bible says in the book of Job. Are you there, amen? I'm going to read in the Bible what we just read in the spirit of prophecy. They all say the same thing. Look at what it says. Job chapter 10, beginning in verse 21. And when you get there, let me know by saying amen. amen. Now I'm going to test and see if you're good students. We're not just preaching, we're studying. I'm going to test and see if you're good students. And I pray that you're taking notes so that you have all these texts and you're putting these thoughts together because God is going to expect you to go and teach this. It's time to get the world wet ready, but not based on what we think, but based on what the Bible says. And my brothers and my sisters, I'm going to test you right now. And in the book of Job, I want you to see, there is something that we're going to read in the book of Job that will make light become darkness. What did I say? That there is something that's going to make light become what? So if you were a child of light and you don't have this, you will become a child of darkness, even though you studied the prophecies. I wonder what it is. I'm going to test you. We're going to read the Bible, and I'm going to ask you. Job 10, beginning and verse 21. Let's read it together. Are you there, amen? Let's read it together. What does the Bible say? It says, before I go, whence I shall not do what? Return. Even to a land of darkness and the shadow of what? Of death. Talking about darkness. How can light become darkness? Verse 22. A land of darkness, as darkness itself, and of the shadow of death, without any order, and where the light is as darkness. Based on that Bible, when does the light become darkness? What does the text say? Three words. Without any Order. What did the Spirit of Prophecy say? Everything was going to be fulfilled how? In its order. Bible Spirit of Prophecy say the same thing. In other words, if we're studying the prophecies, if we do not understand the order of events in the prophecy, the prophetic light becomes darkness. Are you with me? I want to ask you a question. If we understand that, then tell me, how do we know that H is the next letter? Because all these things are happening how? In their order. We have A. What comes after A? B. What comes after B? C. What comes after C? D. What comes after D? E. What comes after E? F. What comes after F? G. What comes after G? Are you guessing? Why not? Because you understand the order. We have a chart. Pointing out every way mark on the heavenward journey, and we ought not to guess at anything. Why not? Because all that prophecy has foretold as coming to pass until the present time can be traced on the pages of history. And we may be assured 
that all, not some, but all that is going to come to pass will be fulfilled. How? In its order. And Job says, in verse 22, a land of darkness as darkness itself, and of the shadow of death without any order, and where the light is as darkness. So if we're going to be children of light, so we're not surprised by the coming of Jesus, we must understand the order of prophetic events, and then we don't have to guess at now, I want to show you the order before we close. In the book of Revelation, what book did I say? Revelation 13, God has revealed to us the order of prophetic events. Do you know that the Bible tells us, if you understand the order of events, that the Sunday law could not have been passed before 1990 if you understand the order of events. And so those people that thought that the Sunday law would be passed before 1990, they did not find where we are and see the order of events. And so they were guessing maybe Jesus is coming. But my friends, Jesus is following the script of Revelation. Jesus is the star. And he's revealed to us the great drama of the ages. And we're approaching the last act. And God has given us the script. And if we study it, we know everything that's going to take place. Surely the Lord God will do nothing but reveal his secrets to his servants, the prophets. Jesus said, I tell you before it come to pass, so that when it has come to pass, you might believe. And if we understand this, we don't have to guess. We can know exactly where we are today. Now, Revelation 13 tells us something. In Revelation 13, the Bible in verses 1 through 10 talks about a power that the Bible calls the beast of Revelation. But in Revelations 11 through 18, the Bible brings to view a second beast, a lamb-like beast, and it identifies this power as a lamb-like beast of Revelation. Now these two powers are going to bring us to the last act of the drama, to the Sunday law. In Revelation 13, I want to ask you a question. Who is the first beast that is described in verses 1 through 10? Who is the first beast? You're not afraid to say it, are you? Because if we can't say it now, you think we'll say it in just a little while? You think we'll warn the world if any man worship the beast and his image and his mark, and we can't say it in the church who the beast is? I'll never forget I went out of the country. And I was doing a series of meetings on the beast and his image, and, and somebody said to me, this is a Catholic country. You can't talk about the beast. I said, listen, if God has equipped me with a threefold message, I will say what Jesus says. The Bible says I have a message to go through every nation and kindred and tongue and people with a loud voice. We don't have to cover it up. And that angel says, if any man worship the beast, we must identify who that beast is. That beast is the Roman Catholic Church system. Now, it's not a man. There are many sincere Roman Catholic Christians. In fact, you know that we're told that the majority of true Christians are not in the seven Adventist church, but in these other churches that are going to church on Sunday. Many of them, good, sincere Christians. And I've seen priests and nuns and members of the church faithful members, that when they studied what we studied from the Bible, I've seen them leave the priesthood and nuns and members to follow the Bible because they listened to the words of Jesus. But while the majority of true Christians are in other churches, the majority of devils are in the Seventh-day Adventist church. And God is going to shake this church up. And God is going to help us to make up our mind because do you know that many Seventh-day Adventists are going to lose their crowds as youth and adults. Just the other day, we were over in another country doing some meetings a few days ago, weeks ago, and as we were doing the meetings, a group came up to us who were not Seventh-day Adventists but had been studying the Bible, and they found out that the seventh day was the Sabbath. My brothers and sisters, the whole church is trying to follow it. God is getting a people ready, and God is going to have fruit and other churches that when they hear the loud cry of the third angel's message, they're going to run in while we have sheep in Babylon. There are goats in the remnant church. And you know how you can tell the difference between a sheep and a goat? A sheep says, whatever you say, Lord, 
I will follow. The sheep hear my voice and they follow me. You are not proved to be a sheep because you call yourself a Seventh-day Adventist. You may be in the right church, but you may be a goat in the right church. You know how you know what a goat is? A goat, when you want to go somewhere, a goat will put his foot in the dirt and say, I'm not going anywhere. A goat would say, I don't care what you're saying. I'm going to do what I want. I don't care what you tell me in diet and in dress and in education and the way you spend your time and money and the way you worship. I'm going to do what I want to do. I'm going to put it on my fingers. I'm going to put it in my ears. I'm going to put it in my throat and in my mouth. And regardless to what the Bible says, I'm going to do what I want. These are going to be shaken out of the church. And the sheep that are faithful to the Bible are going to remain and the sheep and other churches, when they hear the loud cry, they're going to come out of Babylon and they're going to join the remnant church. And the way that God's going to know the difference is those young people and adults that are willing to listen and live by not tradition and feeling, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. And the Bible says in Revelation 13, that first power is the Roman Catholic church system. While many Christians in the church, the system is of the devil. When you have a man that's above the Bible, when you have a man that speaks blasphemy, claiming to forgive sin and claiming to be God, that is the spirit of Antichrist that started in heaven where Satan wanted to take the place of God. Down here on this earth, this man, they call him the Holy what? Father. The word Pope means Papa, Father. My friends, do you know that when the Pope comes, that the President of the United States, he looks at him and calls him Father? You know the, the previous President, George Bush, when he saw the Pope before he left office and one person asked him, what do you see when you look at the Pope? You know, the Pope, you know what he said? He said, I see God when I see the Pope. Now that's blasphemy. That is blasphemy. The Bible said that this power would be a blasphemous power. This is the Roman Catholic Church system. He is not a man of righteousness. The Bible says he is the man of sin, my friends, who exalted himself above all that is called God, who sit up in the temple of God showing himself that he is God, and he's trying to take the place of Jesus. That's blasphemy. The Bible says that this is the first power, Roman Catholic Church, but the second beast, I wonder who it is. In Revelation 13, beginning in verse 11, let's read that together. In verse 11, the Bible says, And I beheld what? Another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake how? As a dragon... I have a question for you. When the Bible talks about the second beast, the first beast was the Roman Catholic Church. And verse 10 of Revelation 13, it says that he that leadeth into captivity shall do what? Go into captivity. When did the Roman Catholic Church go into captivity? In 1798. You remember that. You remember that they used to put people in prison, but the Bible says, he that puts in prison, in captive, shall go into captive. And in 1798, you can go to your encyclopedias, you can go to history. In the history books, it says that the Pope was put in prison in 1798. And in 1798, the prophecy was fulfilled that he that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. What's the year? The year 1798. Immediately, John sees another beast rising. What's the year? 1798. And so in 1798, John says, I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb. Now, when the Bible says he came up out of the earth, what does it mean to come up out of the earth? Is this a real beast or a symbolic beast? It's a symbolic beast. And in prophecy, what does a beast represent? A kingdom or a nation. What text says that? Daniel 7, verse 23, tells us that a beast is a kingdom. 1 Kings 18, 10 says that a kingdom and a nation are the same thing. So we find out that a beast rising, in other words, in 1798, John beheld in the Revelation a nation rising in 1798. And it says it will come out of the earth. What does it mean to come out of the earth? 
What does that mean? Now, how do you know it means low population? The Bible speaks of the other beasts coming up out of the sea or out of the water. And water in Bible prophecy represents what? Nations, multitudes, tongues, people. It represents a populated area. What text is that? Revelation 17, verse 15. It tells us that people... Nations, multitudes are represented by water. And we say that all the time. We say we saw a sea of people, meaning a populated area. So if the beast rose up out of the sea, this represented nations rising up out of areas that were heavily populated. But when we see a nation rising up out of the earth, the earth is the opposite of sea. And so if sea is populated, then opposite of that is an area that is not heavily populated. And so for a nation in 1798 to arise up in an area that was not heavily populated tells us that it could not be in the old western world, or old world. It had to be sought for in the western continent or the new world where the area was not as populated as in the old world with this turbulent sea of nations and people. Are you with me? I want to ask you a question. What nation of the world was rising in 1798 in an area in the new world in the west that was not heavily populated and then the Bible says would have horns like a what is a lamb in Bible prophecy? What is a lamb in Bible prophecies? The Bible explains itself, is that right? In Revelation 13, 8, what's the last part say? Revelation 13, 8, the last line, John the Revelator says, the lamb slain where? Who was the lamb slain from the foundation of the world? You remember that John the Baptist saw Jesus in John 1, 29 and said, behold the Lamb of God, which take away the sin of the world. And so a lamb represents Jesus Christ. And so for a nation to have horns like a lamb, and the horns are the leading power of a nation, then that means that this must be a so-called nation that is being led by Christian principles. This must be a so-called Christian nation. Now, my brothers and sisters, there's only one nation and only one that meets the specification of this prophecy. Unmistakably, this is the United States of America. And the Bible says it would have horns like a lamb, but when it spake, it would speak how? As a dragon. What does it mean for a nation to speak as a dragon? What does that mean? How does a dragon speak? How does a dragon speak? I was one place and a person said, a, a, a dragon speaks with fire. I said, no, that's cartoons, amen. <laughs> you see, there's nothing in the Bible that says a dragon speaks with fire. But when you study the Bible, the Bible tells us that the nature of a dragon is in Revelation 12, verse 13. Look at what it says. I want you to see from your Bible. Revelation 12, verse 13. Revelation 12, 13, the Bible says, And when the dragon saw what? that he was cast to the earth. Now notice, we're noticing the nature of the dragon. It says, and when the dragon saw that he was cast into the earth, he did what? He did what? He persecuted. So what is the nature of a dragon? It's a persecuting power, is that right? So for America, for America to speak as a dragon means that America will become a persecuting power. Are you with me? What type of persecuting power? Because a dragon persecutes, but there are two types of persecution. There's both civil and religious. What type of persecution does a dragon do? Look at what the Bible says, verse 17. Revelation 12, 17, the Bible says, And the dragon was what? was wroth with the woman. Who was the woman? The church. And went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which does what? Which keep the 
commandments of God. That's enough for now. So the dragon is a persecuting power. Who does he persecute? Not just everybody. The dragon persecutes those who keep what? Now, my brothers and sisters, the commandments, they deal with more than just civil entities, don't they? The first four commandments deal with our relationship with, which means that the dragon is not only a civil persecutor, but if he's persecuting those who keep the commandments of God, that means he must also be a religious persecuting power. And so for America to speak as a dragon means that America will begin persecuting those who keep the commandments of God. Is that happening today? No, not happening like it should be. In order for that to take place, something must completely happen to the Constitution. Because today, what does the Constitution say? That there should be a separation of what? But my friends, you know that's not going to remain forever because that beast with the lamb-like horn, it, we're told that it's not going to remain like a lamb. We're told that the beast is going to change. You ever heard the word change? My brothers and sisters, we're getting ready to see a change. And when we come back this evening, I'm going to show you something at 3 o'clock that is going to stir you from the center to circumference because something is happening right now that will show us that this change is getting ready to take place. That America is going to speak as a dragon and begin to persecute and that means that every principle of the Constitution must be repudiated. Every principle must be changed and there must be provision made for the propagation of Sunday worship. There must be a union of church and state in order to have a national Sunday law, and we're only a few short months from this taking place. My brothers and my sisters, the Bible says that there is an order. I'm going to get ready to close with this. I said that the Sunday law could not have been passed before 1990. Where did I get that from? Revelation 13. Look at what it says. The Bible shows us an order of events. It says that America is going to speak of the dragon, is going to persecute, is going to pass a national Sunday law when she speaks of the dragon. And now in verse 12 says, can we read that together? The Bible says, what does it say? And the exercise of how much? All the power of of the first beast before him and cause it what does the word cause mean force to make and he calls of all to do what he calls if the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose daily wound was what his daily wound was healed. Now, I want to ask you a question, my brothers and my sisters. Is the daily wound healed today? No, the daily wound is not healed today. The healing has started, but it's not healed. The wound has started to be healed, but it's not healed. You see, the daily wound happened in 1798 when, um, when, when Rome lost its civil power. When the, well, let me say that. Let me say this first before I say that. In Revelation 13, the Bible says, he exercises of all the power. How much of the world is going to worship the first beast? How much of the world? The Bible says all the world is going to wonder after the beast. Now I want to ask you a question. The Bible says that if you don't go along with America, the Bible says in verse 16 and 17 that no man will be able to do what? Buy or sell. It goes on to say that if you don't go along with this power, verse 15 says, and he had power to give life, until the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. I want to ask you a question. In order for America to force the world to worship the church of Rome, I want to ask you a question. What type of power did America have to be? What type of power? Well, it had to be a persecuting power, but, but it had to do more than that. Let me, actually, let me say it this way. Is there a child here? My young man, young man, young man, how old are you? 
What's your name? Ethan. Thank you, Brother Ethan. How old are you? Ten. Okay. Brother Ethan. Everybody see Brother Ethan? Raise your hand, Brother Ethan. He's ten years old. Praise God for him. I, I pray that this will be a gospel ministry. Amen? Missionary in this last hour to prepare people to meet Jesus. He's ten years old. Now I have here this marker. Brother Ethan is right there, and I say to Brother Ethan, Brother Ethan, I want you to take this from me, and I'm not going to let you take it from me. Can he take it from me? No, he can't take it from me. I know Brother Ethan can't take this from me if I didn't want him to. He's not big enough. Is that right? Why can't he take it from me? He is not what? He is not strong enough. But now if I look across this room, my eyes might find a person who may be a little bit stronger than that. Is that right? A little bit bigger than that. I see a man I'm looking at right now that can probably take this from me even if I didn't want him to. Are you with me? And the only difference is that one is stronger, has more power than the... And the Bible says that America is going to cause or force the whole world to worship the Roman Catholic Church. It's going to exercise all of the power of this first beast and cause the world to worship. Now, my brothers and my sisters, could America force the world to do anything in 1776? Why not? It didn't have enough power. Do you know that, 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 that the colonists, that England did not believe that the colonists would even win the American Declaration? That when America declared independence, they believed there was going to be a short victory, slap them on the hand and say, colonists, do what you're told. But they did not know that prophecy was in the making, that a beast was rising, as Revelation says. And my friends, in 1776, America could not force the world because she did not have enough power. Well, tell me something. In World War I, did America have enough power to force the world? America had no power to force the world. What about World War II? Do you know that in World War II that America was an isolationist, didn't even want to get into war until Hitler almost beat up on them and to find they said, we better get in or we're in trouble. And that's a whole other story. If you were talking about how God brought the fog in on the very day that the American soldiers came in, they would have lost if that didn't happen. God was in the making because prophecy has to be fulfilled in its order. Now, my brothers and my sisters, tell me something. In World War II, was America the, 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 the most powerful nation in the world? You know, in history of nations, America ranked about 13. In the history of nations, the most powerful nations, even after World War II. What about during the 60s and 80s? Was America the world power in the 60s and 80s? They were in battle with another power that was called what? It was called Russia. And for a long time, people did not believe that the prophecies were going to be fulfilled. They thought that revelation cannot take place because Russia had space exploration, Russia had tanks, Russia had atomic bombs, everything that America had, Russia had, and the world wondered what was going to take place. The world was locked up in a cold war. But something took place in 1989. What happened in 1989? What happened in 1989? The Berlin Wall fell, and the Soviet Union collapsed, and it left the United States of America as the sole remaining superpower. What year? That happened in 1989, and so by 1990, by 1990, America now was in a position to force the world because she now had power over how many nations? Over all the nations. And the interesting thing is, who brought the Soviet Union wall? Well, who brought Russia now? This is on the front cover of Time magazine. This was from February 24, 1992. If you won't believe the Bible, you have to read it in history. Look what it says. Time. How Reagan, who was Reagan the head of? Who was Reagan a uh, leader of? The United States of America. It says, how Reagan and the Pope, who's the Pope the leader of? Roman Catholic Church, conspired to assist 
Poland's solitary movement and hasten the demise of communism. And time called it the holy, but the Bible calls it the unholy alliance because in Revelation it says America is going to exercise all the power of the first beast, that America is going to cause the whole world to worship the church of Rome when she becomes the world's sole remaining superpower. So the order of events... Before America could force the world, America had to become what? And America did not become the superpower, not in the 40s. Remember, those were UFOs. Not in the 50s, UFOs. Not in the 60s, UFOs. Not in the 70s, UFOs. Not in the 80s, UFOs. But in 1990, the UFO became an IFO. And now America, for the first time, became the sole remaining superpower. And from that point, uh, we should have begun watching because it was time for a Sunday law to get ready to be passed. And my brothers and sisters, do you know that when you study the prophetic chart, that from 1990, there were only six events that had to transpire before the Sunday law was passed. What did I say? Do you know that in 2009, we are in the middle of number five? There's only one more that needs to take place that would bring on the Sunday law, and it's almost here, and everything is ready but the people of God. I want to close right here. That Time magazine says why the Pope loves America, and I'm going to tell you why. Here's a man. He's been in the cities of this world, and he goes down one of these streets that's not safe to walk on at night. And he goes down that street, and all of a sudden, a man pulls out a knife and stabs the man in the heart so that he's almost dead, and he lays on the ground, and blood begins to come oozing out. And when the blood begins to come oozing out, my brothers and sisters, he's getting ready to die. If another man comes, and when another man comes and takes that person who's sick, and begins, could you, could you just sit back here for just a moment, then I'll, then I'll bring you forward. Just sit back here just a moment, please. And then that man who's laying on the ground, he's in a pool of blood. And all of a sudden, another man comes by, picks him up, takes a, a cloth, wipes off the blood, begins to nurture him and admonish him and heal him until his daily wound is healed. Tell me something, would that man love him? With a man who was almost dying, would he love him? You remember Jesus gave the parable about the, uh, about, about, the, about the Samaritan, of how he picked up and healed and rubbed this man and healed him. That man loved him because of that. Do you know that the Roman Catholic Church received the daily wound? Is that right? But we're told that America is going to heal the wound of the papacy. America is going to give its strength and power and authority for the world to worship it. And so the Pope loves America. And my friends, we don't have but just a few short months. And when we come back in our service at 3 o'clock, we're going to pick up right here from the Bible, and we're going to prove with the surety of a doubt that we have a great work to do and but a little time. Do you know what the work is? We need Jesus in our hearts. We need that day to die. We need the day star to arise in our hearts, and tonight or this afternoon we must make a decision that we're not going to put off the work of preparation. Old and young, we don't have to care what everybody else is doing. We must say what Joshua said, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. I don't care what everybody else is doing. I'm going to follow Jesus. And that's your desire this morning. You say, Lord, I don't care what the world is doing, but I want to follow Jesus. Then I want you to stand right where you are. My standing, you're saying, Lord, I want to follow Jesus. And if you can't stand, just raise your hand. My raising your hand, you're saying, I want to follow Jesus. Would you reverently kneel with me? Oh, Father, you've been with us this morning. You have shown us that we don't have to guess at anything. You have given us an order of events that if we understand where we are, 
and the sequence of time, that we will see that our only hope is to have Christ formed within the hope of glory. Many are going to find too late, Lord, that they're going to think that this is something to play with. Old and young are going to recognize that what shall it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose their souls? And many are going to find out only when the door of the ark is shut and the rain is falling. And oh, how many are going to wish for the meetings like this and weeks of prayers and time for a service, but it's going to be too late. But Lord, as we're kneeling this morning, it's not too late. We can open up our hearts. We hear Jesus knocking, knocking at the door of our hearts. And as youth and adults, we want to invite him in. Oh, Father, this morning we ask that you would come into our hearts, that you will be with every kneeling soul, that as Joshua said, that we will make it up in our mind that regardless of what everyone in the world will do and the churches will do, that as for me and my house, that we will serve the Lord. May that be the decision of every kneeling soul. And we ask this in Jesus' name.